today I'd like to talk a little bit about what we at the Film Commission can do better. Where we are today, and then raise something that as an industry, I think we should all concentrate on for the future. So three sort of areas. Just over 400 people completed the survey, and overall the results were positive. Previously, the annual stakeholder survey that the Film Commission has run has been largely a numeric type of survey. And it gives us ratings to put in our annual report. And you'll still, still be able to see those when the annual report comes out in November. Um, but this year, we also asked for a lot more in-depth commentary and feedback. And so I want to share some of that with you today. Overall, the Film Commission is rated very positively in terms of interaction with fi filmmakers. Filmmakers are appreciative of the work we do internationally at festivals and markets like Cannes and China and feel we add real value. We seem to be heavily involved in building the international reputation of the industry. We have been praised for strong leadership, energy and vision, quote, energizing the industry, creating a sense of getting things done. Yet at the same time, some people have criticized us for excessive interference and control. We've been praised for our written communication through letters, uh, newsletters and through websites, but also criticized for not being available for phone calls or responding to emails quickly enough. Some people seem to have a little bit of a problem knowing exactly who they should be talking to at the New Zealand Film Commission. We have received a lot of positive comments about how outward facing we are and how we are communicating better. Um, people mentioned a feeling of momentum, and as you can see in the reel, more films in production, more screen work, and more activity generally. But around 10% of respondents tended to have critical comments. And as a result, we will be looking strongly at ways we can make changes that will improve the process of interaction. We will almost certainly never satisfy all of you all of the time. Uh, I know this from spending 40 years sitting where you're sitting. We also, of course, have to answer to our board, to the Ministry of Culture and Heritage, and now to the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, to our Minister and to the Auditor General, to the agencies who channel around about $100 million a year of government funding through to the screen industry, or to the film industry in particular. And so to the person who wrote in their survey, give me all the money, that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> I would, however, like now just to spend the first third of the speech talking about these criticisms and commenting on them. We need to be more accessible and approachable. I agree. In spite of a bigger workload, due to the increased amount of production happening at the moment, we need to make sure that we're out and about a lot more around the country and connecting with filmmakers. We need to explain what we do and how we do it. So as a first step, we will be hosting some interactive seminars at the dates that will be up there. So if you want to take a note of those and keep an eye on the website, um, that will be happening in a town near you. And our idea for this is not to turn up and talk to you the way I'm probably talking to you today, but to have groups of our staff at different tables throughout the venue. Um, and they'll be listed in areas like talent development, uh, development and production, incentives, attractions, international relations, co-productions, marketing, and so forth. And then at 45 minute periods, you can rotate around those groups. And if you've got a film that you know, is being finished and heading towards marketing, then you can talk to the marketing department. If you're at the early stages, you can talk to development of production or to talent development. And this will come up again on a talk in the speech, very much making sure that you have a sense of who are the right people at the Film Commission that you should be talking to. So please keep an eye on our website for the actual venue details, which are not finalized yet. We've also been asked to make sure that you have the information that you need to make strong applications. And so I can say to you today, yesterday we uploaded something we've been working on for several months, which is a whole bunch of new funding guidelines, which are in much plainer English and much clearer. And we now also have moved into the, probably about into the 20th century, actually, around the 21st century, we have electronic cover sheets for you to fill in. It's a big step for us. <coughs> it's a lot harder than you think, actually, apparently. Some people are concerned that our staff are not expert or experienced enough. I think they are, but I think that we have not promoted them and their expertise enough. I've worked very hard in the 22 months that I've been at the Film Commission to add staff to the Film Commission who have experience and a background in the industry. People like Mark Ashton, 
who has an onset background as a first AD, Kate Larkindale, who's actually run cinemas for years, Linda Hale, Chris Tyson, Kristen Rowe, Karen Williams, and Jude McLaren with a production background, Christina Andreef from a directing and writing background, and Rachel Corley and Tracy Brown from Post. And very recently joining us, Jackie Wood from Christchurch, where she worked in production and for Film South. By my count, 18 staff at the Film Commission have worked in development, production, post-production, exhibition, distribution, or marketing. Most of the other staff, apart from IEA and the front of house, have degrees in accountancy or law, which you would consider appropriate for working in the accounting area or in the business affairs area. So the people that I'm talking about, particularly, uh, most of you will have got this brochure when you came here, and what I'd like to do now is just ask our staff to stand up so that if you don't know physically what they look like beyond their head and shoulders, you can actually have a good strong look at them now. And you can please approach them. We are approachable. This is one of the best venues. The reason we do this is to encourage you to talk to them. Thank you very much. And also I'd like to introduce our board, uh, the members that are here, having just turned this around. Ch uh, Chair Dame Patsy Reddy, who's here, if she wouldn't mind standing up, along with Chris Hampson. Uh, and our new board members, uh, Ian Taylor, who's very loath to stand up, but we're making him, and Ross McCrovey, both from the Deep South. So thank you. So we, we are listening to your criticisms. We want to make ourselves available to you. We'll be going on the road trip. We'll be trying harder for you to understand the background of the people that you're talking to. We have also received criticisms about the way that we relate to you, about inconsistency of feedback and timeliness. And I absolutely accept the question of timeliness. And it's something we are working on extremely hard. And that's really a question of consistency. We need every single one of our staff to have the same attitude to timeliness, because we only need a few people to let us down, and then you have an attitude that we're slow to respond. Um, in our defence, and I think this was acknowledged very heavily in the survey, uh, people wrote quite a lot that they knew that there was an increase in production and that they knew that people were working very hard. But nonetheless, we still need to do that. And while as an ex-independent, I'm very loath to increase the staff numbers, particularly in an agency like the Film Commission, I can give you an interesting example which I think you would be sympathetic to. When I arrived at the Film Commission, the role of incentives executive was a part-time role. That we now have three people working full-time in that role, and we are struggling to keep up with that incentive situation. But they're handling around about $80 million worth of applications, and I think that's not a part-time job, and I know that job has to be done well, and it has to be done well for the filmmakers, and it has to be done well from a government point of view in order for the government to feel comfortable that we are doing it in an appropriate way. So another... Um, area that's come up is a discussion on what's an appropriate level of the Film Commission's involvement in productions. And in fact, in the box, there's a question along those lines as well. Some respondents to the survey expressed considerable resentment that we had any involvement whatsoever past the point in which we said yes. Unfortunately for those few people, uh, that situation is not going to change. We always have had and will continue to have script approval, cast approval, and crew approval. We have openly communicated to the industry constantly that what was called the development department is now called the development and production department, and that we do look at rushes, and we do comment on those rushes occasionally. We have introduced a thing called the pause clause, which is generally feared by people who've had nothing to do with it, and much loved by those who've taken part in the process of the pause clause and the test screenings. We don't have final cut, and we have no intention of seeking or moving or changing that situation. And I need to point out that our board is very supportive of the level of involvement we currently have in productions, and I believe that some of the recent films we've invested in, like Born to Dance, are proof that our involvement can be beneficial. Um, one of the lines that I try to use a lot with the staff is a line called More Than the Money. And I do want the Film Commission to be seen as an area of expertise and people who can contribute to the industry beyond writing a check and sending it to people and never being heard from again. So, but tied to that, I guess, is the other question, beyond when we say yes and how much involvement we have, is the question of saying no. And this was mentioned occasionally in connection um, to the communication theme. So most people are very happy with our approach, but some are not. And I think it's important to say we are trying to probably 
to be clearer with people when we say no. Because I think, as most of you would appreciate, you know, a good, clear, fast no is better than a lot of mucking around. And I know that, um, as I say, we say no more than we say yes. And we don't, it's important to understand, we don't have unlimited discretionary funding. So our discretionary funding comes, there's a little slide coming up here, um, from around about $5 million from MCH, or Ministry of Culture and Heritage. And this year, probably around about $13 million from lotteries. Now, the lottery money is decreasing, and it's decreasing quite quickly. Um, and I'm not sure whether everybody is aware of this. And so, for example, when we were having conversations with the guilds um, on Friday, you know, it was something we needed to make aware that in talent development has had cut. Literally every area of the Film Commission internally has had a cut except production funding, uh, which is something that we've tried to hold at the same level. Um, people basically aren't buying as many lotto tickets uh, for various reasons, and so as a result, the amount of money we got a little over 12 months ago was $16 million, and now it's down to $13 million. So you can see that's quite a difference. Um, and I do think that we are being more honest and upfront in the way that we uh, report to you about what we think about your projects. We've been working very hard to simplify all of our script feedback, and we no longer provide pages and pages of notes with time code numbers on them. I'm strongly encouraging staff to provide clear, simple, and honest feedback. Another area that was brought up is budget level, so I'd like to talk briefly about that. The vast majority of respondents were very happy with the increase in the number and variety of films. However, some people complained that the Film Commission was driving budgets down to achieve those numbers. We have certainly had some robust conversations with producers about budget level and non-government funding. But I think it's very important to state that these discussions have almost always been associated with the relationship to the market or to the audience size, and occasionally about whether they could bring other people's money to the table. And even as recently as the other night, I had a quite robust conversation with someone in which they said to me, you told us to reduce the budget. And I said very clearly, no, I didn't. What I said was, at that level of budget, you need a clearer market plan and a clearer audience plan, and maybe you need to bring some other money to the table. But if you wanted to make it at a lower level, as a low budget film, then you would probably fit into an area where you wouldn't necessarily have to have such strong market attachment. So it was very clearly an either or, but I think in this particular case, as people perhaps heard what they wanted to hear, which was the Film Commission is driving budgets down. And I just need to be very, very clear about that. I'm very comfortable having these conversations, as you can tell. Um, I'm a reasonably robust character, and we'll touch on that in terms of the question box later on. <laughs> in fact, maybe we'll touch on it now. We didn't ask for the question box. It was a very nice idea from Big Screen Symposium, but I've had a considerable amount of feedback that says, ah, you obviously don't want to answer questions at the Q&A. Bring it on. I'm very, very happy to answer any questions. I think there was a feeling that perhaps you were the shy people. Maybe you didn't want to ask the question. So we're going to do a bit of a mix. We're going to have a couple out of the box, and we're going to do a Q&A. There are a number of other pieces of feedback that I don't have time for today. One of them actually comes up in the Q&A, so that's good. Um, it doesn't mean they're ignored. It just means that in the very brief speaking slot that I have, I've tended to concentrate on the key criticisms and either acknowledge them and, and, and talk to you about what we're going to try and do, or in a couple of cases like the budget level and things like that, I've been reasonably clear about what we think about it. We do know we need to get out and about more. We need to be more visible. We need to make it clear who are our particular people that you should be dealing with, and whether or not they have expertise. We recognize that we need to strengthen our working relationship with you by improving our communication. We need to be consistent, and probably most importantly, we need to be timely. So let's shift from process to results. I strongly believe we're making excellent progress towards the five planet goal that I talked about here last year, which if you visit the Film Commission, you will see up on the thing, and if you get a card from anyone at the Film Commission, you will see us on the back of their card. And that goal is to walk out in the middle of the night and imagine as a metaphorical concept five planets shining brightly in the sky. Pathways and careers for people, increased economic activity, more eyeballs on films here and overseas, culturally significant films, and amazing, original, different, satisfying films. And these, I believe, are the goals that we will be judged on at the Film Commission in five or 10 years' time. 
But if we can also improve the way we work with you, well, obviously that would be good. So keeping this process of shifting from the process to the results, let's have a look at the fact that right now, as we sit here, there are 21 New Zealand films that we know that are somewhere between pre and post right now. So films that are shooting or about to shoot, 1,000 Ropes in Wellington with Tussie Tamasisi and Catherine Fitzgerald shortly, Chief Gary with the low-down concept, um, directing, I think, starts shooting on Monday in Rarotonga, McLaren directed by Roger Donaldson, Spookers with Florian Harbert, the rehearsal is um, coming to a close with directed by Alison McLean, and down south later in the year, we hope to see Human Traces shoot. Films in post at the moment include Hunt for the Wilder People, starring Sam Neill from Taika Waititi, Inland Road from first time feature director Jackie Van Beek, Poye directed by Tara Pakahi, and Six Days from Tua Fraser. We've also just had a very good run at festivals, with two films including a winner at Venice, which I think is the first time we've won in Venice, and three films in Toronto. One of those, Born to Dance, has just opened in New Zealand and should comfortably go over the million dollar mark, probably by the time uh, you wake up in the morning, uh, or maybe the day after. Thank you for that. But please go and see the film as well. <laughs> <coughs> By the way, from the exit, we, we have also, uh, some of you will be aware, we published an exit survey from the Deadlands, uh, which was very interesting. And we have done an exit survey on uh, Born to Dance, which is not published yet. The next film we hope to do an exit survey on will be Mahana. And by that stage, we'll have quite an interesting comparison of three very different types of films and be able to learn quite a lot about why people go to see films, New Zealand films in particular. And already the differences between the exit survey for Born to Dance and the exit survey from uh, the Deadlands are quite revealing. Uh, one of the interesting things I can share with you is that four out of five people who saw Born to Dance loved the film, described it as a distinctively New Zealand film that celebrates our culture and showcases our local talent and creativity. And one out of five are probably very reluctant boyfriends. <laughs> <coughs> Likely to open in the first half of next year, uh, I mentioned Mahana just briefly, Leah Tamahori's Mahana, and Taika's Hunt for the Wilder People, Leanne Pooley's 25 April, and our first Indian co-production, Beyond the Known World, written by Diane Taylor. On the international attraction side of the business, uh, we have successfully begun the integration of Film New Zealand into the Film Commission, and I'll talk about that a little bit later in the speech. Next year, we hope to see the return of Shannara, on the international side, Power Rangers and Ash vs Evil Dead. DreamWorks Ghost in the Shell has also replaced Pete's Dragon in the Stone Street Studios, and we know that our two international television series are confirmed and currently in pre-production for New Zealand shooting before Christmas. The PDV business has had a last little boost recently from the reduction in the threshold, and we're seeing, as well as very large companies like Weta Digital, we're starting to see the growth of companies like Power and Mechanic, uh, which was previously characters, uh, starting to take into that space. And in fact, I'm just getting the feeling that we're getting a little bit more growth in that company structure size beyond and as well as the sort of nimble, smaller operators that we're, um, that we're used to. Interestingly, at the moment, uh, as we stand here, all of the four companies that receive business development scheme funding uh, a year or so ago now have features in production. And I can announce today we've added to that, uh, people will be aware of a thing called Boost, which is sort of like a, a cross between the old uh, devolved development themes and, and the business development scheme. And we're going to announce five companies today that have been successful in that funding. And they are Robin Scholes and Jump Productions, Vicky Pope and Pop, Jason Stutter and Kevin Stevens from Centron, Emma Slade from Firefly, and Tom Hearn from Four Nights. So our films are achieving critical success here at home. The Ground We Won and Born to Dance, both very strong reviews. And at overseas festivals, similarly, the extremes of Petra Brick Kelly's Flickering Truth, Jake Mahaffey's Horizonte winning uh, Venice film, Free Indeed. And at the moment, there's some most absolutely extraordinary reviews if anyone's online and looking at them for uh, Deathgasm in the US from people like, you know, that you would not expect, like the New York Times. Um, so quite extraordinary. So our devolved, I want to move now a little bit into diversity. So our devolved funding to Hayara, I think, has contributed considerably beyond the normal type of applicant that we were seeing at EDF funding. So just looking, if you look now 
at the names of the actual individual people involved in writing projects uh, in Hayara schemes. It's very, very encouraging to look at those Māori and Pacifica names there. Um, in April, as part of this new diversity um, policy, we announced some gender initiatives, and they were going to be driven largely by our talent development team. So our gender initiatives are largely based at the early intervention stage, and the intention is to encourage fresh and diverse voices, but also build the sort of confidence and resilience that we know that's needed at the feature film level. And one of the, we're already starting to see some results in the first short films round this year, Fresh Shorts, uh, four out of the five films that were supported are uh, written or directed by a woman. And following strong applications um, in the professional development area, 60% of the successful people are women. And of the 10 scholarships that we offered uh, to attend uh, the Big Screen Symposium, seven of those went to women. And you might recall in April, <clears throat> You might recall in April that we announced Jane Campion's support of a thing called the JC Cinefem Scholarship, which was subsequently awarded to Maria Innes Mancheco. And I want to announce today that uh, next year's scholarship will be for female directors and will be supported by Gaylene Preston. The nature of the scholarship will be announced by Christmas or early in the new year after further consultation with Gaylene. So again, please, if you are a female director, uh, please keep an eye out for that. On the international relations side of our diversity policy, We've begun to support talented Asian New Zealand festival filmmakers like Beijing-based actress Augusta Zhu Holland um, and writer-director Han Yu. Augusta recently starred opposite Joseph Fiennes in the Hong Kong Chinese US feature film The Last Race. Han is only one of 12 filmmakers worldwide accepted into the prestigious Venice Biennale College Cinema. Han's also the first New Zealander selected for the acclaimed Taipei Golden Horse Film Academy run by Ho Xiao Shen. Closer to home, Christchurch-based Korean Kiwi screenwriter producer Sean Shin has two feature film projects selected for the Busan and Taipei co-production markets, and Sean's also the recipient of a three-month Korean Film Council producer residency in Beijing. Okay, so what I'm trying to do in that is just give you a little bit of a snapshot of some of the things that we're involved in and some of the things that hopefully, working in the industry, you feel something of a groundswell in terms of activity. So in the middle of all that positivity, I'd like to just mention two challenges that we're involved in, one that we're heavily involved in and one that we want to share with you. So we have inherited a, a new challenge and it's one that I'd like to suggest um, that is pretty exciting and that we'll be concentrating a lot in the next 12 months and that's the integration of Film New Zealand into the Film Commission. <laughs> Trying to work out who that is. <laughs> Um, our attractions and incentive staff will work much more closely now with the regional film officers and have a better relationship with them. We have our first one-day workshop with the regional film officers on the 20th of October. We also want to have a very, very strong relationship with the rainmakers like Rob Tappett and Barry Osborne and the critical high-level line producers who are so important to the flow and success of inward productions, like Chloe who's sitting there, for example. More importantly, over the next eight months, or perhaps most importantly over the next eight months, what we need to work hard on with MB and with Stephen Joyce is securing a better line of funding that is more secure than the year-to-year -year funding that Film New Zealand had. One of the advantages of the Film Commission is that we know that we have that $5 million funding from the MCH pretty much every year. Where we might have the lottery funding dropping, but we have some security in that. Film New Zealand, we're in the unfortunate situation where the funding was to some extent a little bit day-to-day. Uh, -day. And one of the things we hope to have as a Crown Agency is a stronger relationship with MB, A, get more money, and B, actually have it in a slightly longer term so that we can start to plan ahead on some of the initiatives. And with that, for example, we want to have a stronger, more constant presence in places like China and Los Angeles. We want to work together with key people in the industry to come up with um, an ongoing Los Angeles plan that includes regular events there that are pan-industry. We want to work with the regional offices to improve access to locations for filmmakers, which we know is still a problem, and to improve access to those, I think, is very critical in places like Auckland, even in the city, and we know in the South Island in terms of the relationship with DOC. Uh, we also want to build infrastructure, which I'll touch on in a moment. We want to assist updates of the safety code of practice and the blue book. So what you're starting to see is that as the Film Commission 
integrating Film New Zealand, we will be taking a little bit more of an active position and spending a little bit more money in some of those areas that will be useful for you on a day-to-day -day basis. And we also want to sharpen up uh, our international marketing materials, which we can do by integrating the two organisations. So in simple terms, basically we want to get more money and we want to share it with you. Um, no, I didn't want to say that. We want to secure more money and we want to deliver more in partnership with you. Sorry. <laughs> Small mistake. But actually, we do want to share it with you. We aren't actually keep the money, you know. We do actually spread it around. Um, so now the, the second challenge that I want to talk about and probably the one that I'm sort of really hoping that will get some traction with you and there's a thought I want to leave with you um, because it's something that's, I think, been uh, causing a little bit of angst for some people over the last little while is we need, I think, to present the industry to the public of New Zealand and to the government as deserving of the financial support that it receives. And um, as I mentioned earlier, we administer around about $100 million of government money per annum. And there's no scale law, there's no ceiling to some of that to a degree around the incentives. It could go higher if there are more applications. And so that's the number that we're thinking is around about the number for this financial year. Uh, also, bear in mind, NZ on Air um, put about $80 million a year into the television industry and to Mangapaho, I think about $40 million a year. So our industry stands out as an industry that has quite a high level, uh, quite a high proportion of government funding. And I think we need to be incredibly clear about the benefits of the funding. And we need to be more organised and we need to have better messaging and we need to show a lot more leadership than we did during the crisis a couple of years ago. And I'd like to suggest a few things that we can concentrate on that will help the industry grow and maintain government support. And the first one is probably so obvious but absolutely important. And that is we just need to make very good culturally significant films that people go to and feel proud of. And that's an absolutely critical thing for the general public. And that is the, probably the key thing, and that is the thing that you are probably the most in control of. Second thing that tends to be something that's probably a little bit more uh, an MB sort of national government type thing, but I think also very important and for people to understand that it's critical. And that is the growth of companies that employ people at above average wages, and companies that have developed a degree of intellectual property and income streams, so they're not wholly reliant on the incentives. The third thing is we do desperately need to develop new infrastructure in studios in Auckland and in Queenstown with private money. You will have got the sense from what John said yesterday in his reference to when he was asked about the Screen Advisory Board that from a Wellington point of view, from a Film Commission point of view, from a government point of view, and from our association with the Screen Advisory Board, we are doing everything we can to support ATED and the Auckland finance, uh, film finance area to get that studio built in, Queen in Auckland. And one of the things we're trying to do is to see whether off the back of that we can put a box in Queenstown as well and maybe have them tied together. And so we are very, very supportive of Auckland in terms of getting that studio built out in Hobsonville. The fourth thing is a sharper entrance training funnel and upskilling during careers. That's a big step and I think that it will take us some time to really get on top of that, that whole training area, but we are beginning some conversations with the guilds about trying to make a lot of the mid-career uh, opportunities to be more demand focused. And just as a very simple thing, uh, we're running um, uh, production accountancy courses or assisting those at the moment. And they're not just because there's a shortage of production accountants, but because we also want to encourage people to understand the process of production accountancy so they're not just for, the, for half a dozen production accountants, but for people to just generally upskill around that area. Um, the fifth one I was talking a little bit yesterday with the Actors Guild about, a much larger acknowledged group of star actors, writers, directors and producers. And one of the things we want to do when we, when we set up these pan industry events in places like Los Angeles, we want to have functions in Los Angeles on a yearly basis where we recognise you know, the up and coming star actor that, that gives them some pr promotion within Los Angeles or the, the most prominent international New Zealand based producer Things like that, that just start to create a little bit more of a star system that helps us. Um, the sixth thing, cohesion, cohesion between guilds and agencies. Um, and I think that the relationships at the moment, generally, that we have with the regional offices, and I hope that we have with the guilds, I think are stronger than they have been in previous years, and we need to continue that. And then the last thing um, is something probably that people don't fully think, but I've talked a lot about when we end up in situations where we're talking about our industry, um, and many of us are, we really need to create some sort of cheat sheet 
um, so that we know what key statistics are involved and what are the key sort of things around our industry. And so we need some sort of regular, ongoing statistical proof through research that the film industry employs very large numbers of people throughout the country at above average wages, contribute significantly to the economy, and help sell NZ Inc. offshore. And that selling of NZ Inc. offshore is, a, is, is certainly something that we take quite seriously. And just to give you just a small example, with 25 April, uh, when we were in Toronto, and we were, um, we were very lucky that the uh, Turkish distributor who had pre-bought the film <coughs> had come uh, to the screening and attended the party afterwards. We couldn't talk to him for about 10 or 15 minutes because he was so emotionally overcome with the film and the effect of the film upon him, which I thought was incredibly cool since he was a Turk, uh, Turkish person seeing a, you, know, you know, the story as it were from our point of view, but obviously he, it, it, that was quite affecting to him. And he's very, very keen to do a lot of things in Turkey around about the same time as the film releases in New Zealand. And we followed that up by getting in touch with our ambassador uh, in Turkey and talking to him about just a number of simple ideas and whether we thought they would be possible, such as screening the film in Anzac Cove for that large contingent of people who are there overnight uh, on the big screens before the thing in the morning. And he got very excited about that and a number of other initiatives. Now, these are the sort of things that you know, then feed back into government level and then the government feels that making these films and putting these money into these things, it isn't just a question about you know, local cultural identity, it's about an international one as well. So I think that we need to do a little bit more of that. So what I would love to do is early in the new year, I would like to suggest that, um, I've talked to Enzel and Air about this, I've begun talking to uh, the guilds about this, um, and I'd like to talk to any agencies or organisations and to the film industry at large, and suggest that we get together and we try uh, to answer maybe these three key questions. So what does a successful film industry, or what does a successful screen industry look like in five years' time? You know, what's the difference between now and five years? What, would, what, what, what things do we need to be aware of? What needs to be done or changed? You know, what could we do better? What could we do differently? And how do we maintain and grow the government support associated with that industry? So I'm very, very keen for the Film Commission. We will take whatever role is possible, but if we can be a ginger group or we can start to coordinate that, that idea so that we essentially, we don't get ourselves in a situation where we were two or three years ago where we were, and I don't think it's overcooking it to say an industry in crisis, and we need to avoid that very much. And we'd like, what we need to do, which is not very good at, is planning ahead while things are pretty damn good at the moment, and now's the time to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Christina Milligan. I'm just going to be steering this Q&A to make sure he gets an opportunity to speak who wishes to. We do have some of the questions from the um, box here, and I'll feed these in as we go, but it would be great to start with a question from the audience, please. There is one mic, sorry, I'll finish in a sec. There's a one mic uh, travelling up around the back. I will repeat questions that are asked uh, so that we all hear them. There was a question here. Yes, um, at the beginning of the clip, you were throwing an animated Yes, that is a film called 25 April, and you are sitting right behind the director of the film. No, no, behind the director of. <laughs> <laughs> you are sitting behind a very acclaimed female film director called Leanne Pooley, who directed that film. So, that is an animated film about the Gallipoli campaign, and I think you can tell from the title of 25 April when it might be released. The question was, has the Commission got more interest in doing animated features? I'm going to answer the question wider because we get asked questions about uh, are we interested in doing this type of thing or that type of thing and what's, you know, is there a special fund for documentaries or you know, a, a, a version of that. We're interested in doing a wide diversity of feature film projects, whether they are documentaries, uh, dramas, animators, animations or not. We're also interested in trying to create a diversity of films for audiences. So the um, metaphorical analogy that I use is that I, my, my idea of how I would judge whether we've had a good year or not, uh, apart from boasting in front of you here, is that I would go to a Christmas party with an incredibly wide variety of New Zealanders, um, socioeconomic, ethnicity, age, all sorts of different demographics. And every single person at that party would have seen a New Zealand film that they loved in the last 12 months in a cinema. Now, if we can do that, then I think we're successful. 
Now, what we, we're not doing that yet, you know, we're just so simple things. We don't, at the moment, we haven't had a family film uh, come through recently, so we're very conscious of that. We've been working quite hard to encourage comedy because comedy is difficult. So, really, it's a very long answer to, and the short answer is yes. <laughs> just coming off the uh, mention of Leanne there, there was one of the questions in the box was, what about some positive discrimination for women filmmakers, a designated fund, perhaps? Yeah, um, at the moment, not a designated fund, but what I would like to draw your attention, because I have realised that when we announced our gender uh, policy, we announced it at uh, functions only in Auckland and Wellington, and it's possible that some people are not aware that the full policy is sitting on the website, and because I did have forewarning of the question, I quickly looked to remind myself of what that policy essentially is. Um, so the first key thing that we're doing, which sounds um, rather odd, but is actually a, a really critical cornerstone, which is we're collecting and publicising data. Uh, so what we did when we launched the policy was we said what was the benchmark. And the benchmark from memory off the top of my head is that currently 52% of the producers that we fund are women, 32% of the writers that we fund are women, and only 8% of the directors that we fund are women. Now, those numbers are now probably a little bit old, but that's the point of benchmarking them, and I would like to think that I would be able to stand up here in 12 months' time and that those numbers would have taken a... Well, not perhaps the producers' numbers, because they're not bad, but those other two areas would have taken a significant jump. So the first thing is the numbers. The second thing is we have a very clear target in professional development of 50% participation. Uh, again, we believe we will comfortably hit that figure this year, and you saw me quote a couple of numbers around that already. The third thing is that we're encouraging all of the people on the staff, particularly in professional development and generally in development, to actually identify and engage specifically with female filmmakers and to be encouraging and to push hard when people say, oh, well, maybe, or I'm not sure I'm qualified, or oh, it's not sure if they're good. We're pushing hard now to try to, to help people get through the gate. Um, and the other thing we're doing is things like the JC Cinefem and the Galen Preston Director Scholarship. We're doing those and we're talking with guilds about trying to target some of their proposals to us around training uh, and at doing it. Key thing to, to, to make clear that we brought up at the gender, one of the things we have discovered is our the success rate of women roughly measures the application rate. So we're not turning down very, very large numbers of female directors for feature films. We're not getting the applications. So we think the answer is not necessarily right there. The answer is in the way that a little earlier in the, in the drafting race, as it were, to try to get people there. So they're the four um, key platforms, and you can read that under our diversity policy. Another question from the audience. Yes. Um, I've been looking for you guys for years, and I'm just wondering if maybe you're aware of some sort of funny hack so I can find you. <laughs> I think we um, can answer that by also pointing out what? that the, uh, everyone has received a um, booklet with their photos. I'll tell you what we'll do. At the end of, at the end of this session, I'm going to ask the staff to just come down to the front um, to make it easier to find. And so there should be a dozen or so film commission staff around the front. And if you carry your little brochure with you, and if you know what area you're looking for, then it should be all good. Yes, up the back there. Um, my question's about writers. Um, you talked about upskilling, and mm -hmm. I'd really like to know what you're doing about upskilling writers, because writers are the kind of essence of what we do. Or, and my experience, it takes a long time for a writer to get good, if you know what I mean. And I've always felt there's quite a shortage in the sort of uh, but supporting writers to upskill in, in an international level, like, you know, international mental shorts, and I know you do do some programs, mm. but to me this seems like a really crucial area, and I'm really interested to hear what you've got yeah, uh, sure. planned for that. Um, obviously we're not a training organisation, so we don't actually, in an ideal world, we don't want to be uh, hiring a whole lot of staff and running uh, training courses. The writing area, I think, has had quite, uh, the main areas that we devolve money to in those areas are the Writers Guild uh, and also Script to Screen. And I would say that Script to Screen, from my observation, seems to be an extremely efficient training organisation. Um, I think if people feel that somehow or other between the Writers Guild courses and what the Writers Guild do and what Script to Screen do, that somehow there's a gap, then I think that that's something you should certainly bring up with us. But it's not for lack of probably resource being pushed in that direction. 
but probably in terms of our, you know, we, you know, we're not ideally running courses. I think if we start running courses, and there are film commissions around the world, like the Irish Film Board, about half the staff of the Irish Film Board run courses because they inherited a, like a training organisation. Um, today, my preference would not be to do that, but to do it through devolution. But the really important thing is that, that we're, we're dealing with the guilds on a three-year cycle or on cycles and that. If you feel that the training that's associated with particular guilds is not strong, uh, then I think it's up to you to certainly tell us as the funder. And we did get some quite interesting, um, and in fact, maybe we could just jump to that question. Yes, there's, there's a... There's some uh, quite interesting question around the Writers Guild uh, funding. And so I was... The question was, uh, one from the box, why do we have to clip the, ends, uh, the Writers Guild ticket before the Commission takes our applications seriously? And I, I'm not quite sure what that answer means, but in the, in the feedback that we received, there was uh, some quite well-reasoned um, uh, thesis from somebody about the fact that we were devolving money to the... And I was trying to catch you before, Alice, to give you a warning of this, so I am sorry. But um, we have to answer all the questions fairly and honestly, as you know. Um, so there was some criticism of the fact that we were giving money to the Writers Guild and then for people to apply for seed funding, they had to pay an application fee of $100, or I think it was $100 or something. And people were basically, this person was saying, well, look, this is government funding, why should I also have to pay $100 to apply? And I think that's a very good point, and I think we will have to sit down and have a conversation with it, because I find that hard to answer, uh, other than... Yes, that seems reasonable. And we're giving you some core funding. It would be better, it would honestly be better for you to say to us, you know, um, give us X thousand dollars to process them rather than for the applicant to probably have to pay. Okay, another question from the floor up there. Oh, hi, everyone. Uh, Matt Horrocks. Um, just um, three things. First of all, um, Dave, great presentation. And um, I thought that was really clear and really positive, and I would guess that you'd, you'd have buy-in from a huge portion of the industry. I'm waiting, for the, I'm, waiting, I'm waiting for the butt, Matt. It's not a terrible butt, don't worry. <laughs> uh, another observation is, is that um, people, you know, I think feel that over the last five years, not, not necessarily just when you've been CEO, that there's been quite a radical increase in the power that staff exercise over the industry. And there is, you know, potential pushback um, building within the industry for that. Um, and a part of that also is relationship between the board and the industry. And it's really great to see you guys here because um, we actually don't really know who you are. And, and we don't think that you know who we are. But you might be really good people. <laughs> <laughs> they are. Yeah, they are you might quite like us. And, um, you know, there should be m much more communication between the board and the industry that could be formal. It should be formal. It should also be informal. But there is like a, a balance of um, industry, of uh, interests and powers between staff, board and industry. And all of those, you know, people need to be talking to each other. And so that's just something that I would, I would like to flag and that that could be good for staff, and it could be good for the board, and it could be good, good for us. And so that when we're talking about these big um, macro, you know, strategic directions, there's a chance of having everyone's buy-in. And there's also a chance that when there are these disagreements that are, arise within the industry, which always will, um, that, you know, that can be resolved within a, in an environment that overall is, is positive and that we're all moving in the right direction. So, sorry, it wasn't really a question, but... <laughs> It was a good presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. There used to be a guy in Wellington called John Smythe um, who used to stand up and ask questions that weren't questions. Uh, but I have to say, Matt, you were a lot more succinct than John was. Um, uh, look, uh, as you will be gathering, and I'm very happy to say it, I'm a pretty robust character. I've had a couple of run-ins with Matt, as Matt knows. So, you know, we, we have a little history here on a film. But we're incredibly proud of the film. It's in the real. Um, filmmaking is not an easy job. You know? There are always going to be disagreements. There's a large amount of money involved in feature films. Um, and I would like to think we're being clear. Sometimes being clear, straightforward and simple can be taken uh, as being you know, difficult or rude or whatever. So you know, it, it is a fine line and we accept that. Um, 
but I'm also uh, very happy for people to go right above me and complain to Patsy. Patsy, you're happy with that, aren't you? <laughs> Maybe not. No? Maybe she is. I don't know. Um, there isn't, uh, you know, there isn't technically a review, uh, uh, you know, a sort of a strange review process of, of how people deal with us when they're not happy, but I guess the obvious one is to go to the board. Yeah. Another question? I'll take one from the box then. Do you find, do you find networking sycophantic? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Uh, I think that's more a question being asked of me when I was a producer. Um, I, I'm quite intrigued by this question. Uh, networking is not easy. New Zealanders are probably amongst the worst networkers in the world. Uh, I would encourage you to do more of it. I, um, I think that when we have overseas guests, people um, are very polite to them and respect their space and everything. Um, I, t I was talking to Christina about a story from years ago at one of the early Sparta conferences and I was sitting in the sort of area equivalent to out there talking to a guy called Kim Williams who was the head of Foxtel and I had a meeting that I'd organised with him and after about 15 minutes he looked at me and he said this is a very strange meeting Dave and I thought what? why is it a strange meeting Kim and he said because nobody has interrupted us and he comes from a much more robust Australian environment where if he was sitting chatting to someone in a coffee bar at a, at a conference, people would come up and say, excuse me, Kim, uh, my name's so-and-so and I'd like to pitch you a film. Would you be able to talk to me after this meeting? Um, and as New Zealanders, we're not very good at that. You know, we don't do an awful lot of it. And I don't, I don't think it's sycophantic. It's actually what, it's how the business works. Um, so we're pretty relaxed about being, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm encouraging the staff to come down here and for you to come and talk to them. So, so you know, um, maybe, Maybe that's a question we turn back on the person who asked the question. Yes. A question here about the production curious accounting about. that Dave mentioned. When you um, probably rather than answer it for everybody, it's probably on, I'm guessing it's probably on the website, which is a sentence I say occasionally. Um, but uh, when uh, Dale, who's head of talent development, is incredibly easy to recognise. He is the only person trying to be Che Shavara uh, with, uh, with the beret back there. It's a sort of a brand, you know. So, so Dale, production accountancy after this. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. The question is, what was the commission's involvement in Turbo Kid, which is a French Canadian? Uh, it's a Canadian New Zealand co-production. So, then in recent co-production history, uh, we have uh, done a Canadian New Zealand co-production, which is uh, Turbo Kid, uh, which we are a minority uh, co-producer. So, we did. We had an actor in the film. Uh, we did the post, and the key creative people were in New Zealand. It was a very small investment from us. I, top of my head, I can't remember, but I think it was. You, Two actors, there you go, two actors in the film. Um, one of them, unfortunately, in spite of our attempts to make our, our actors more famous than stars, spent the entire um, thing with the mask on his head. So didn't, probably isn't going to do his career as much good as we had all hoped. Um, and, we, and Post was done here in the creative for Post. And then the other one we've done recently, which is also in the reel, um, is a New Zealand Israeli uh, co-production that um, Matthew Metcalf produced. And we have just provided funding at our meeting last week for um, a New Zealand-Australian co-production, formal co-production, which we're pretty excited about because that's been a little bit slow. Um, although there is a television co-production with um, Clever Man operating with Pukeko um, into Australia. I've got, yes, down here. So the real trace is a lot of set things in there that we probably wouldn't know about. Mm. So the question was whether the Commission could be involved in screening films before they're released to people in the industry to enable them to be more aware of what's coming up. It's a, hmm?
Um, I don't think Graham was intending that they wouldn't pay. In fact, I think there would be a higher price probably for industry, <laughs> uh, especially for agents, you know. 10% higher probably, <laughs> with a small management fee on top. Uh, <laughs> um, it's a great idea. I, 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 rather sadly, I know in the past, uh, filmmakers, people would talk about screening films at uh, conferences like this in an evening. You know, they'd say, well, let's screen a film on a Saturday night. And I know that many, many filmmakers have been extremely reluctant to screen their films in those circumstances because the industry can be uh, quite critical and quite negative. Um, I guess I hope those days have gone. Um, but, you know, uh, it's an interesting thought, you know. Sorry, up here I've got the mic. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, it, it kind of flows on from the last question in a sense, and that is what work is being done in terms of audience development. Um, as you know, I kind of advocate in the area of kids and screen, and you're talking about a family film, but what I'm interested in is are you looking at the audience development in terms of kids today and them growing up to recognise and see New Zealand films and being audiences in the future? And is there going to be kind of a, a policy direction around that? We, um, Jazz's area in the marketing and along with Selena Joe, are working quite hard to try to get a better profile of who sees New Zealand films and where they see them. So that's one of the things behind the eyeballs. Um, you'll notice we don't, we're not using as much the box office gross. I mean, you can read our annual report, you will see all the box office grosses, but you'll also see a figure called eyeballs. Uh, eyeballs in the last year are up from 8 million to 10 million on New Zealand films. Now that's a historical New Zealand film, so that could go back as far as you know, a family film that I produced in 1983 called The Silent One might be included in that statistic if it had played on the television network you know, been selling in a DVD store, or been in a VOD download, or anything like that. So we, we're, we're trying to get a lot more numbers. Um, we're, we're statistically have been very impoverished, um, but we want to do more work at growing audiences, and we are very, very keen to do more work on growing young audiences, which is one of the reasons we were very supportive for Born to Dance. But we don't yet know quite enough information, um, and I know the marketing department are really keen on doing it, and I think if you, you know, if you wanted to work with us in that area, we would be really, really happy to do that. Thanks. Question up in the corner there. Sure. That's fair enough. Can we get a microphone for Alice? Writer Guild lady has a name. I'm Alice, the new ED at the Writer Guild. <laughs> uh, referencing back to why do people need to go through seed funding before they get to the Film Commission? Essentially, we're doing you guys a service to help you get ready to be financed. It's a development process. You go through assessment, blind assessment. That means you get feedback on your scripts that you can take them to the Film Commission or a producer to take to the Film Commission that is ready to be made. Um, but of course, it is not a prerequisite. No, it's there's not, not a, a there's not a um, there's you not a thing that says have you been there. to the writers guild and got a stamp of approval? Um, it's entirely voluntary. Would it, the the original question was around having to pay for that uh, submission, you know, to submit well, it, to that. So, but I think um, perhaps Dave answered that in a, in essence, it is administration. We have to pay for the assessors mm. to read the scripts. Mm. So okay. I think we'll have a we'll have a bit of a look at it and yeah. and see if we can um, you know because it was you know th these are fair comments. Thank you. I have another question down here. Um, it's a question about the Ministry of Development and Health and mm. uh, basically about the dropped out of the situation. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, your project has a no debt to it. That's um, a question, sorry, of how long um, perhaps development debt on uh, development on a film, if it then uh, doesn't succeed at that point but gets up later, whether that debt still hangs yeah. over it. Yeah. So technically when you get a development loan from us, it's not repayable on interest per annum and, and has to be repaid. It's a, it's a contingent liability, I guess, to some extent, in that if the film never went anywhere and was never made, you would never have to pay us the money back. If the film is made, then 
what we normally ask for is for the money to be paid back to us, which is our preference, um, or in some circumstances will allow it to be placed as equity within the production, particularly if we're making an equity production uh, contribution. If it was going offshore, yes, technically we would want to be paid back. Having said that, we are flexible and there are circumstances under which we will forgive very long-term historical loans um, and, and you know, if, if you can get the film up in another way and we've turned you down and we don't like the film and you can get it made, uh, good for you. You know, I, I think we'd be, pretty, uh, we'd be pretty relaxed. We've got time for unless you, unless, unless you, you know, someone complains to the board, in which case it'd be a problem. But, you know, <laughs> it should be all right. We've got time for about two more questions. Yeah. We're tending to see shorts more as a pathway to features. Um, I think last year in the speech, and again, there's a little visual thing on the website somewhere of, of stepping stones to features. And so we see shorts as one of the many stepping stones to features, and there are a number of other ways. You don't have to go through that particular way. So, so that's the key thing. We don't see shorts particularly as an end in themselves, although I know that upsets some people in the audience. We do see them as a, as a pathway. Secondly, in terms of budget and genre, no. No, absolutely not. We're as happy to see $200,000 films as we are to see 15 or $20 million films. Um, and in fact, uh, one, of the, one of the sad things that I've talked about with a lot of people is that when I arrived, it was post a period called Escalator, in which an enormous number of people had applied under an Escalator scheme to make low-budget films at $250,000, and that scheme didn't exist anymore. And suddenly, miraculously, those large numbers of people who wanted to make low-budget films seem to have kind of died and gone somewhere because we received virtually no applications under normal funding criteria, which would be perfectly acceptable. And we've announced to the industry we have a matching fund deal with a partner in the US, 50-50. And so far, we've made one film under that, and we have another one in active development. And I'm kind of horrified. And when we met with a partner in Toronto, they were like, um, we love this last film. Where are the other, where are the other low budget films? So that's for films under 500,000. But it does mean those films have to have a market. Um, but, you know, there's no, I don't want to have, I don't, we don't want to be an agency that says, you know, this is the genre, this is the budget range. It, anything, anything that is good and has an audience. Do we have a last question? Yep. Um, just in terms of eyeballs, mm -hmm. Yes. At the moment, the eyeball figure that we're counting is the New Zealand eyeball figure. It's not the international eyeball figure. Um, it's a really interesting question. Um, I'd kind of like not to encourage them, but. Um, No. And I think I think the position we would take would be we would prefer that the films are monitored, you know, are watched by people who pay. It's a strange old fashioned kind of concept. <laughs> uh, uh, but you know, we we're all hoping that eventually piracy will will go a certain way because if you can make the films more easily available. Um, because there is you know, reasonable evidence that in some cases people are pirating, not because they don't want to pay, but because they want to see it and they can't find a way to pay. Um, I know that's not the case with Turbo interestingly enough, because it is available on VOD. We're going to call it to, uh, to a close there and all go and have some lunch. I'd like you to thank Dave for his contribution. Thank you.